All right, chapter 4, the Holy Spirit and prophecy. The Holy Spirit and prophecy. Of course, he's the author of prophecy, as he's inspired our Bibles. Um, but he's also the subject of prophecy, as the Bible tells us of a future ministry that the Holy Spirit will have. I mentioned just moments ago the present ministry the Holy Spirit has as a global restrainer, a worldwide restrainer, one that hopefully tonight will be taken out of the way. If we hear the trumpet tonight, the church is raptured, there will no longer be a global indwelling influence of the Holy Spirit. That restraint will be ended. It's the only thing hindering Satan from advancing in his plan to appropriate the Antichrist and to uh, advance in the, in the systems of evil that he's got ready to go. But there is a future ministry of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes the second time. All right? How many times did Christ come? Once, and there's a second one on the way. How many times is the Holy Spirit coming? Once for the Church of Pentecost, but there's a second time on the way. Second advent of Holy Spirit, if you want to think of it in those terms. And that's what I want to focus on tonight. All right, so as the author of prophecy... Um, God has spoken. He spoke through his uh, prophets, but he did so through the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, I don't think we have any uh, confusion there. Um, where's the verse in Acts somewhere that it says that uh, the Holy Spirit spoke through the mouth of David? All right. I mean, it's clear that all these prophecies are coming by means of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the human agents. No prophecy we just saw a moment ago is of its own private interpretation, but men who are moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. You know, even the term spiration. Think of where that term comes from. We talk about inspiration, the inspired scripture. What's the spire about? Inspiration. You ever spire? Sp how about respiration? You ever wonder, are they connected? All right. With breathing, with breath. All right. I'm on page 59, I'm on page 60. I didn't color a whole lot here. But I get to page 60, now the subject of prediction. And again, he's going to quote from Walvern. Again, Dr. Walvern may well be quoted on the eschatology respecting the Holy Spirit. He writes in a very long clip, very worthwhile reading. Skip down through here. Um, and he also mentions why this is ignored. Um, you can think about it, but the Old Testament has prophecies pertaining to the Holy Spirit. And we, as premillennialists, uh, identify those prophecies and see their fulfillment in the, the second advent of Jesus Christ and the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. But the bulk of Christianity today, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and um, non-dispensational Protestant, okay, which is the vast majority of Christianity today on the planet, they're all millennial or post-millennial. They're not looking for an eschatology related to the Holy Spirit. They think it's happening now. Just like, just like they think that the kingdom's happening now. Just like they think that it's all happening now. And so confusion related to that naturally will lend itself to confusion related to the Holy Spirit. And that probably shouldn't surprise us. But for those who believe that the millennium hasn't happened yet, for those that believe, I know, crazy people that we are, that Satan is not yet bound, okay? Again, we're in the minority. Um, for those that aren't, you know, preterists and thinking that Revelation was done in the first century, we're viewing that as future, and so there are still future promises regarding the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the plain language of Scripture makes that clear. I'm going to take you to Joel 2 tonight, and there's going to be no doubt that uh, the promise of the coming Holy Spirit was not fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And Peter doesn't say it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. 
but people say it was so that they can try to throw everything in a past completed action. But the promise of the coming spirit is future. Uh, just grabbing something here caught my eye on page 62. The filling of the Holy Spirit will be common in the millennium. In contrast to the infrequency of it in other ages, excluding our own, of course, it will be manifested in worship and praise of the Lord and in willing obedience to Him, as well as in spiritual power and inner transformation. Remember, Israel never had this under Mosaic law. They will have this under kingdom law. They will have this in their millennial reign. And even though the requirements of law are ramped up to include mental attitudes, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and their, their uh, pneumatology, millennial pneumatology, is going to sustain them and empower them to fulfill what's expected of them in the millennial reign. And it's not only Joel 2, 28 and 29. That's not the only passage that speaks of this. And I think that's vital as well. Because if you're dealing with somebody who sadly accepts or thinks that Peter's message in Acts chapter 2 says that Joel 2 is now fulfilled, if somebody has that understanding, sadly, well, what are they going to do with Isaiah? What are they going to do with Ezekiel? There are other passages besides Joel 2. And even if all we had was Joel 2, we can prove to them that they don't know what they're talking about. Pentecost from the start of the church was not Joel 2, the day of the Lord. Isaiah 32, 15, Isaiah 44, 3, Ezekiel 39, 29, Joel 2, 28, 29. You know, when dry bones came together again and breath came into them, you think there was a, something pertaining to the Holy Spirit there? Okay. The fullness of the Spirit will also rest upon Christ, Isaiah 11, 2. When He reigns in the kingdom, it will be under the power of the Holy Spirit. I like that passage there in Isaiah 11. All right, so it's a future ministry. The outstanding prediction respecting the Holy Spirit is found in Joel 2, 28 through 32. Now, just join me there in Joel 2 and understand that verses 28 and 29 are not the entire chapter. <laughs> All right? It's a, it's a nugget, or a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a context in a larger context. All right. And you will note that what precedes it? Well, blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Okay. We had an alarm going off this morning. I thought the place was on fire. Um... It was just a cell phone ringtone. I thought, man, get a ringtone that's not like a fire alarm. It scared me to death. Um, Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, surely it is near. So this comes in with day of the Lord doctrine. Huge in Joel, huge in all the prophets. Okay? Day of darkness and gloom and all that goes on to describe this. A great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it. Ever. Ever before, ever again. It is a unique day. Jeremiah describes this. Daniel describes this. Joel describes this. Jesus describes this. Every single time they're talking about the unique time, they're talking about the tribulation of Israel. After the church, before the millennium. A fire consumes before them and behind them a flame burns and the land is like the Garden of Eden before them but a desolate wilderness behind them. Nothing at all escapes them. It's like our potluck dinners at the buffet serving line after the kids go through. Okay? No, I'm joking. We got good kids. Um, now, verse 10, they, behind them the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, the stars lose their brightness. Joel's not the only one that talks about this. Isaiah talks about this. Zechariah talks about this. John in Revelation talks about this. The astronomical signs that, that take place in the tribulation. The Lord utters his voice before his army. You know, with the shout and the trumpet. There's other things going on besides fetching the bride. There is warfare that is engaged through that period of time. 
Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. The time of Jacob's trouble, the, the tribulation of Israel, has, I was going to say one purpose and one purpose only. It's got several purposes. But for the Israel, it has one purpose and one purpose only. For the Gentiles, it has a different purpose. But for Israel, it is to humble them and prepare them to accept the Christ that they crucified. That's what it's going to take. Rend your heart and not your garments and return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, relenting of evil. Jesus cannot come in second heaven until Israel as a nation accepts him as their king, until they themselves say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. All right, so blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the, el the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants. Kind of interesting. On Palm Monday, the children were singing Hosanna, laying out the palm branches. But the elders, the rulers, the religious leaders were mocking and filled with hate and rejecting not going to happen a second advent. The elders, the whole congregation, including the children, the nursing infants, let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priest, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Okay? This is national repentance of Israel and it takes the tribulation to do it. It takes hell on earth to do it. The Jewish people in the land today are not there by faith. Okay? They're there in unbelief. They're there to set the stage for what will happen when Antichrist is unveiled. They're going to sign a treaty with him. He will take his seat in their temple. But they will repent. It will take tribulation to do it. And so, uh, notice, what do we have? We have a promise of deliverance. The Lord will be zealous for his land. Verses 18 and following. God's going to come. God's going to rescue them. And when he rescues them, they will have plenty. And uh, they're going to forget about all the hardship. They're not going to fear the locusts. They're not going to fear the beasts and all of this. They're going to have plenty to eat and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. Then my people will never be put to shame. The one faithful nation in the millennial kingdom is Israel. The first time in their history. <laughs> They're going to be the faithful nation. They're going to be faithful for a thousand years. Then you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. And my people will never be put to shame. And it will come about after this. All right, so. <laughs> when do you think verses 28 and 29 are going to happen? Well, we're told right here. And I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, on all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. There will be slavery in the millennial kingdom, by the way. Gentiles will voluntarily sign up for it. So they can be closer in proximity to Jesus Christ. To live in the land of blessings. All right. 